don't have to do everything yourself and don't be afraid to you know they say like when you first get into anything right it's like network talk to people go to the events do this do that but like take it a step further define what you're good at and what brings you energy you can like actually do that on a day-to-day basis and not be drained um figure out what you're good at and what you enjoy within maybe a business a real estate strategy that you're trying to do and then identify also where your weaknesses are or what you're really missing to get you to xyz goal spell all that out in your head and then network intentionally to try and find those people and that'll get you a lot further a lot faster if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal then you're in the right place on raising private money We'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now, here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And this is the podcast where we talk about raising private money without ever asking for money. Well, today I've got a very, very special guest that's joining me here on the show. He's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in private money. In addition to that, he enjoys working with homeowners who are going through transitions. Well, as we all know, life isn't always easy. It comes along with its challenges. And my guests can really emphasize with that. So, if buying your house makes a difference in your life, then my guest wants to help you start that very next chapter. So not only is he a real estate investor, but he's also a realtor as well. Now, in addition to that, he and his business partner, one of them's in San Diego, and the other one's in Pennsylvania, um, and they are combined forces, real estate investing in two different markets. Well, their goal is to continue helping people who need it. So what do they do? They pay cash for houses in both San Diego and the Philly markets. Now selling on the market with a realtor can be expensive and time consuming. So they know all about how to save money with their sellers. So the, this dynamic duo, if you will, they make it their goal to help families overcome tough real estate situations and sell quickly, helping other people and always like myself, creating win-win scenarios. So what do they do in real estate investing? And we're going to dig into it. They list, they flip, they wholetail, and they wholesale on both coasts. With that, in just a moment, you're going to be meeting my very, very special guest, Alex Capazzolo, right after this. Well, hello there, Alex, and welcome to Raising Private Money. Thanks for having me, Jay. Excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you. Now, you've got a business partner. His name is John, and you all do all kinds of deals, wholesale, wholesale, flipping, et cetera, et cetera. So you and your business partner, you all been knowing each other quite a while, right? How did you all first meet? We met many moons ago in um, the hardest class to pass, which was kindergarten. Kindergarten. <laughs> well, I'm in a number of mastermind groups, and uh, I'm thinking you and your business partner, John, y'all had some masterminding going back all the way in kindergarten. So when did the two of you or when did you start thinking about and talking about getting in real estate and how did that come about? It's funny because we never talked to business and we grew up as true best friends. Um, he was the best man at my wedding a couple of years ago. And I was just one of the best men along with his brother at his wedding. Um, so true best friends growing up, but, um, yeah, we never really talked about business. It wasn't a thought growing up as teenagers and things like that. And it literally wasn't until the year I moved across the country. And we still stayed in touch, obviously, because we're close. And I read a book. 
uh, changed mindset, kind of opened me up to the thought of like passive income, real estate investing and things like that. And um, I called him and I was also at that time, not a book reader, but this one, it, it was one of those like right book, right time kind of moments, you know, where it just right, hit right, right when you needed it to and um, called him and I, we were 22 at the time. And I told him just to read the book and then talk to me after. And he picked it up, read it in a week. And then um, from there, we started just kind of brainstorming how we could maybe work together and try to also make money. Love it. What was the book? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Of course it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> the classic. I know. Never been said on this podcast before, right? Um, I, I, think, I think I'm the only real estate investor that has not read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Just got to wait for the right moment. That's right. That's right. So how old were you and John when you started? We probably started our first like investment endeavor slash looking for deals together. I think we were 24. Okay. 24 we years started. old. 24 years old. So uh, we're going we're going to get into raising private money here in just a second. But before we do, tell us about your first deal that y'all did. Yeah, it's um, we still hold on to it today. It's a buy and hold um, triplex in Philly. And it was also it was on the MLS. This is back when there were a lot more deals on the MLS. Right. Um, a couple years back. And um, I think it was bank owned, too. There was something. It wasn't from like a traditional mm -hmm, seller, right? Um, but we saw it and we had already raised money before that. So we actually did raise money for this first one. So we had the money and um, we took a swing. We won the bid and we took it down. And that's actually, it's probably our, funny enough, it's our best cash flowing property still today out of all the ones that we've, we've gotten since then. Okay. Well, you just said something very, very important. And I'm so glad you said it. And that is you raise the money actually before you did the deal, right? Right. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what I love about that. And, and I, and I tell you, Alex, I'm sure you have heard this. I'm sure your business partner, John has heard this and it absolutely drives me crazy. Uh, the, you got gurus out there going around telling and instructing new real estate investors. And I know you've heard this. They'll say, Oh, just get the deal under contract. The money will show up. You ever heard that, Alex? A couple times. That yeah. drives me crazy. Drives me crazy. I'm going, where is the money going to show up? Is it just going to sort of like rain out of the cloud? Now, you know, if somebody's wholesaling deals and they've got a list of buyers and has a buyer's list, well, guess what? They were probably smart and put that list together before they went out there and started getting deals under contract. So I practice and I preach all the time, get the money first. The money comes first because there's always going to be deals. There's always going to be deals. So let's go back to your very first private lender that you and John got. Tell us the story about how you found and how you got your very first private lender. Uh, what relationship are they to you, uh, if any? And how did you start the conversation? And how did you get them to become a private lender with you? Family friend. Family um, friend. Uh, on my side. So a, right? a friend of my family, not John's. But John had met them a couple times growing up and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, even to take a step back, we didn't really know where to start. We were just thinking there's got to be someone we know that has some money looking to invest, um, that's something more passive, they can earn interest, it could be a win-win type thing. We had no idea who that person was um, and didn't think they'd be so close to home. Um, not our direct family, but a family friend who was pretty close to me growing up um, and still is. So since we didn't know, we just, we created like a, almost like a mock presentation of a deal that we, you know, as like an average deal in Philly, this is what we'd expect in terms of the numbers, but we did it fully through step by step by step. And the, the, I think the mindset that we kind of entered this with is what questions are people going to for sure have 
And then even further, what questions are people going to think and not even ask us, but they're going to be like, like that doubt, like what doubtful things are they going to think? And we came in with that mindset when we decided, designed this whole pitch deck just on PowerPoint on our computers and um, tried to answer all those questions. Like, for example, this person might not live in Philly. So like, what's the local economy in Philly doing right now? What's the future economy doing in Philly? Like they, at the time, Philly had planned to uh, build a skyscraper downtown, which I think is the tallest building in the city. I forget if not maybe okay. like the second or third, but um, they ended up building that. But that was something that we added into the pitch deck was like, oh, it was it was Comcast uh, was the company building that building, uh, the skyscraper. And it was supposed to bring 5,400 jobs to the city, big economic growth. And, um, you know, it's, that's just things that we kind of added in that were, were good to know. And and at the time, my partner and I were pretty well versed in even like zip code by zip code, street by street, block by block, which is very much Philadelphia. Um, so we included all of that stuff for a mock presentation and just kind of reached out to everyone we knew, both friends, friends our age, friends we were like, maybe they have money, maybe they don't, maybe their parents do, whatever. And this happened to be um, parents of one of my childhood best friends, a different childhood best friend. Um, and they they were interested in learning more. And then from there, we kind of hopped on a couple different calls, gave them the rundown of how it could work and what they could expect. And then, yeah, they, they funded us. And then eventually we got you know a deal not too long after that. That's awesome. Well, you went about it the very, very smart way because desperation has got a smell to it. And so you weren't desperate when you were talking about your program, talking about what you could offer, um, as opposed to having this deal under contract and you're trying to run around and get funding, you know, for that deal. I mean, the worst time to be raising private money is when you need it for a deal. And I'll tell you, you went about it a very, very smart way as far as thinking about what would the objections be or what would the questions be that a new potential private lender has. So I want to dive into that a little bit more as to some of the other questions you thought about that a private lender might have. So um, let me ask a few. So um, let's say that I'm, uh, I'm a new, I'm a friend of yours and I'm a new potential private lender. So let me just ask some questions. I'm not going to do a role play, but here are some questions, popular questions that I get from new private lenders when they're learning about how they can loan out money and make high rates of return safely and securely. Um, so one question would be, well, what happens if you, the borrower does not pay me the lender? How am I protected? What are my layers of protection? What's my recourse, uh, in case you don't pay me for that one, at least for us, we spelt it out. Like we would first have a, an honest and open meeting just to review exactly the situation, what's going on, honest, transparent. So everyone's on the same page in that moment. Um, cause you don't want to come up with a plan and then like also not disclose part of what's actually going on. So first is just honestly lay out everything on the table and then, um, we would just come up with a plan, um, but first see if the, the private lender had any just like preferences at that point. Um, ideally, we'd still like to keep the deal and try to make it work. So whether that's getting put on a payment plan with interest that was on the table and an option and put into our agreement that that is just something we can negotiate over and we can we'd be open to it if that worst case scenario happened and we were having trouble paying you back. Um, we could start there. That's the ideal because that's just. You know, if they if they believe in us and trust in us long term, I mean, obviously, the hopefully the money thing wouldn't happen in the first place. But if it did, hopefully we can kind of re uh, re regather ourselves and uh, still pay them back over time. So that was option one and probably the preferred option two is you know, they, they could foreclose on us as a lender and then do whatever they need to do. Um, and that's just kind of like a fail safe for them. Worst case scenario type thing, but was on the table, too. Right. So like myself. You and uh, John, your business partner, you all are giving your private lenders a mortgage or a deed of trust, securing their note by the real estate that you're investing in, right? Yeah, that's right. Awesome. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, legally we can borrow as real estate investors and entrepreneurs, we can borrow unsecured, uh, but we don't. 
We don't put our private lenders in that position. We always give them here in North Carolina. It's called a deed of trust. It's that document that collateralizes the note to where, and here's the answer that we tell, you know, new private lenders. And the answer is if I don't pay you, the property does. If I don't pay you, the property does. So that way they're protected. Um, another layer of protection. Go ahead, uh, Alex. I was going to say, great way to say it. And that, like, I bet that makes people feel at ease a lot. And it's just easy to remember that line. So I like exactly. that. Exactly. And, you know, I give my private lenders, I've got 47 of them right now, individuals that are funding our deals. We give them additional layers of protection. And I'm wondering if you do as well, Alex. Uh, we name our private lender as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. In the, and that gives them a layer of protection because if there's ever a claim against that insurance policy, then the, uh, more the insurance company is going to name the private lender on that check that they make it payable to. So like if you borrow money from the bank um, and you get an insurance policy and you've got a mortgage with the bank, then the bank is going to be named as the mortgagee on that insurance policy. Uh, so I don't know if you do that or not, Alex. We haven't, but I really like that. And I think that makes sense. Um, so we probably will start, right? Because like you said, it's like when there's just a normal bank involved, that's just how it works with insurance a lot of the time. So um, I like that. That's a good thing to add. Exactly. Um, now, here's a question, Alex. You might not have, um, uh, you might not have thought about, or you might not have been asked, but you'll want to have an answer for it. So I'll put you on the spot. What if a private lender or a new private lender looks at you and says, what happens if you die? What's the answer? Who? Oh, um, both me and my partner just got, just got <laughs> married good, the past couple of years. That's a good question, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, man, I guess like off the top of my head, who, who's ever spouse is now the, now lost their husband. Um, they would have the opportunity to continue owning that 50% um, of the property or, uh, or they could be bought out by the current partner. And then the current partner would have a meeting with the, the private lender to see what makes sense so, to you. So I just heard you say something important. So your private lenders, you're giving them 50% ownership and equity in the property. Um, well, in this, in this instance like that, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough but one. I mean, like with my pro with my private lenders, I'm just paying a straight 8% interest. They don't have any ownership in the property. Right. But I'll tell you my answer, um, which I seldom get, but, uh, my answer is of course, my wife, Carol joy, we're in the business together, but if something were to happen to me, then, um, our, um, our attorney, is the uh, trustee uh, or executor of the estate. And um, so he's instructed to liquidate everything. And as the properties are sold off, then the private lenders are paid off when the properties are sold. So anyway, that's our, that's our exit strategy. But anyway, let's move. Go ahead, Alex. I was going to say, that's a good way to do it. I yeah. Like it. So let's move on to your superpower, Alex. Your superpowers. So uh, you've told me that one of your superpowers is marketing and systems. You do different types of deals. You're wholesaling, you're um, retailing, you're wholesaling. By the way, just to make sure our audience understands, what's the difference between wholesaling and wholetailing? Wholetailing, you're actually buying it and it's it's almost the way to think about like a really quick flip like a cosmetic flip if it's hardly any cosmetic sometimes we just call it a whole tail um but you're actually taking it down you're buying it yourself uh taking title to it and then maybe cleaning it out and that's all you do you don't even paint it you just clean out the trash and then put it back on the market um and you would do that in an instance where like if the deal is better suited for um selling it on the mls Oftentimes, if there's like a big difference in that versus selling it to an investor, we'll go that route and just take it down ourselves, maybe clean it out and then put it back on the market and just kind of wait. 
Um, both John and I are licensed agents in our respective states. So we save on the fees and have control over the listing and all that, which is nice. And then wholesale is just, you're, you're kind of the middleman and you're conveying the contract between the buyer and the seller and not really, and you're not actually closing on it yourself unless you're doing a quick double close same day type thing. But um, it's more of like an, a middleman type thing. There you go. All right. So let's talk about your expertise. When you say you're really good at marketing and systems, what do you mean? And be as specific as you can. Well, we started our business only in Philly, and this is when I lived in San Diego in California. So I was forced to not be able to help my partner do all the in-person stuff, which I still feel bad about to this day. I don't feel bad. You know, we, we both do our part, put in the same similar hours and all that um and both bust our butts but i was forced to just be on the computer and try and help try and help grow our business from across the country because we were only in philly at this time so i just learned lots of different system stuff marketing things because it's all i had to do it's like he was busy i was setting appointments for him i would i would be like a lead manager type thing and i was you know talking to people setting setting appointments for him to go to in person in philly doing lots of stuff like that um and as our business grew we needed more of a system to manage the leads, to, to follow up, to send automated texts. We have all sorts of bells and whistles at this point integrated into our CRM or before or after um, to make sure that we're not only the quickest company to get back to these people if they reach out, like if it's an inbound lead, uh, which are most of our leads at this point, they, they find us on Google and on online through SEO. Um, they're usually filling out, you know, like when you when you go shopping or looking for something online to buy, you always just fill out the first thing. Some a lot of people they fill out one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, the first couple websites that show up on Google. So it's up to us to not only you know send them an automated text, say, hey, just got your form, fill out, we'll reach out soon, but also get back to them soon and then be able to track that follow-up. So that's just like an example of like day-to-day -day stuff that we've built out. We even have a system now that like if if someone calls our website. And both John and I are busy and it gets routed to both of our phones, right? If they call our, our website, it gets routed to both of our phones at first or picks it up first, gets it. If we both miss it, then it goes to another system that we just hire. We hired out another company and then they answer it. So we're always answering. We're always staying on top of it because when leads come in, um, especially through SEO and online, they're usually pretty hot. Um, so if we don't jump on them right away, we oftentimes miss out on them. And that having that really tight system has helped. Uh, grow our business and just monetize as many leads as we can. Well, based on what you just said, Alex, it reminds me of uh, marketing 101, which says the older, the colder. Well, what in the world does the older, the colder mean? The more time that goes by from when that lead first raised their hand, reaching out to you, and until you get them on the telephone, the less likely you ever will, right? And of course, the older, the colder the longer time goes by between talking to them and actually closing the deal, it becomes less likely. However, there's another side of that coin. The money's in the follow-up. So that's why your CRM system is so important, keeping up with all of your leads. We just closed on a house a few weeks ago. We started talking to this person a year ago in our CRM, and you can just track all the conversations since that time. Now, one thing you mentioned a moment ago, Alex, is um, you're getting leads from Google and you're using Google. So I got a question for you. Are you doing your own campaigns with your own pay-per-click or are you using companies and you pay them um, pay-per-lead instead of pay-per-click? We've done it all. Um, <laughs> actually, yeah. Gosh, I mean, story of a, a real estate company that's been around for a long time, right? You just, you try everything and you find what, what aligns and works for you and your lifestyle and, and your flow. Um, right now, we actually don't do either of those things. So we used to buy leads from a company that got their own leads. Don't do that anymore because the quality went down, but it did work for a bit. The ROI on it was like two or three X, but like they just, it was a lot of quantity uh, for low quality. So it was kind of like draining us a little bit and stressing our systems and at least our, our current setup. And then, um, we used to do PPC as well, but not that much. Um, it just got really expensive. And, um, because of that, we, we actually fine tuned and learned, 
um, SEO, so just ranking organically below the PPC section. Um, and I, you know, just kind of, again, because I was forced to just be on the computer, clicking all day here on the West Coast, trying to grow our Philly stuff and um, learned how to do SEO and got us ranked. So now we rank number one and two for like all the good key, most of the good keywords in Philly at least. And then a lot of them in San Diego as well. So we just show up and we, we don't pay for those clicks anymore, thankfully. Wow, that's very nice. Would you say most of your leads or most of the deals that you're getting now comes from SEO? Up until two months ago, it was 90 seven percent of them we just started a new campaign where we're also targeting some like bigger assets industrial space warehouses so that we're doing traditional outbound for that direct mail cold calling email marketing but before that the past two three years before that it was 97 percent seo three percent referral wow that's fantastic when i have you ever thought about providing seo services for other real estate investors did that in 2021, burnt out, couldn't scale it, stopped doing it. <laughs> in other words, that one on, in words, you couldn't get a VA trained uh, to scale the business because you were doing it yourself, right? Had two VAs and then it was just, yeah, was, I couldn't figure out what I was missing and I was working a ton and not making that much. And I was like, I should just do this more for our business and make a little bit more money. So <laughs> there you go. Repivoted. There you go. Well, Alex, this has been fantastic. Um, what's the best way for, uh, our listeners to get up with you, to continue the conversation with you? I'd say reach out to us on our, our two websites that we have. If you're on the West coast or anywhere, say West of the Mississippi, go to sdhouseguys.com. Um, that also has a lot of different guides on it too. So like, if you're looking to just get into real estate, start certain strategies, we have a lot of guides that, and helpful videos that I've made over the years that, um, are just pieces of, of things and strategies. I follow them. Right. Now, what, not, is the, what is the S and the D stand for? San Diego. San Diego. So to make sure everybody hears this correctly, it's www.sd for San Diego, sdhouseguys.com. And again, what kind of guides and information is there on the website? Lots of different stuff in, around investing. So things about squatter right, California and San Diego, things about rent control in San Diego, things that change a lot, Airbnb laws, which in San Diego County, a lot of the different cities within the county are all making new ordin ordinances about short-term rentals. I stay up to date on that stuff. So I just write about it. Um, so all sorts of stuff, depending on your investing strategy, that could be helpful depending on what you're doing. Okay. Wonderful. Now tell us about your other website. And the other one, East Coast people, it's brotherly love, like in Philadelphia, right? Brotherly love, brotherly love properties.com. And that same thing. I mean, that website's been around for a bit more, but we have a really good one on squatters and squatter, squatter laws in Philly are crazy. We just dealt with squatters for a whole 12 months, went through two different attorneys and spent 14 grand. <clears throat> um, so we know a lot wow. about how that stuff Was works. Was that just yeah. like to get, to get them out of your property? Yeah. So in other words, squatters in Pennsylvania have got more rights than the owner of the property. In Philly, at least they do. Wow. Amazing. It's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I bet yeah, you could write yeah. a, I bet you could write a book on uh lessons learned from that scenario. That could be a whole book. Agreed. Jay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Alex, you have brought so much value. So again, that's sdhouseguys.com for those of you um, investing in California. And then over here on the East Coast, we got brotherlyloveproperties.com. Alex, one last question. We'll let you go. What's the best advice you would give to a new real estate investor just looking to get started? I know you got an article about it there on the website, but best advice for a new investor. You don't have to do everything yourself and don't be afraid to, you know, they say like when you first get into anything, right. It's like network, talk to people, go to the events, do this, do that. But like, take it a step further, define what you're good at and what brings you energy. You can like actually do that on a day-to-day -day basis and not be drained. Um, figure out what you're good at and what you enjoy within 
maybe a business, a real estate strategy that you're trying to do. And then identify also where your weaknesses are or what you're really missing to get you to XYZ goal. Spell all that out in your head and then network intentionally to try and find those people. And that'll get you a lot further, a lot faster. Alex, thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate it, Jay. This is fun. Thanks for having me. You got it. And there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. We certainly appreciate you uh, ringing that bell if you're watching on YouTube. If you happen to be listening on your favorite podcast platform, whether it be Spotify, iTunes, or whatever, be sure and follow, subscribe, like, and share. We appreciate it all. Thank you for joining me here on this episode, and I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.